Good morning. Welcome to Mountain View Church in Kelowna. Even though you can't be here with us, it's good to be with you, even if it is over the internet, and we will have a good worship time this morning. The only announcement that I have is that next Sunday, our preacher will be Dr. Todd Statham. It is well worth your time to listen to Todd next Sunday. And Emery will begin his Revelation Bible study on Wednesday, January the 8th. So that's only about a week and a half off thereabouts. So, as we begin to worship, let's pray. Almighty God, you have poured upon us the new light of your incarnate word. Grant that this light, enkindled in our hearts, may shine forth in our lives and in our worship. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We will proceed to our prayer of confession so that we can worship as a forgiven people before our God. Let's pray. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires, that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength through Jesus Christ, our Son. And whenever we confess our sins before God, we have this assurance. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and a Abounding in loving kindness. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Let us worship in song. I'll raise a hallelujah the presence of my enemy I'll raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I'll raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody 
Oh 
draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise on in me. Ten thousand years and then forever more. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship his holy. We don't have any specific prayer requests that came in this week, but I do want to emphasize that if you want prayer, you can send us your prayers on the email address that's also on our website. You can find a link there, prayer at mountainviewcolona.ca, and you will be prayed for, and please Add to your prayer request whether you want this to be uh, personal and not made public. We won't read it in public, but it will be prayed for by our elders, our prayer team. So please use that. Let's pray. Father, we come before you as a worshiping people. We come before you as a prayerful people. Our prayers are prayers of wonder and fear and joy. Our prayers express our frailty and weakness and need. We continue as an expectant people before a promising and merciful God. We thank you that you are a praying God, that Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit petition you on our behalf before your throne. We come before you as a humble people. You are our sovereign Lord. You know all things. So lead us as you know we need to go. And we trust you to provide beyond our wildest dreams. Take a few moments to pray wherever you are, silently for that which is on your mind, on your heart. And now let us pray together as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now I want to take just a moment to thank God for the way that he has been providing for Mountain View ministries, and it is a wonderful thing to be able to thank God that we have the ability to give from the bounty that he's given us. Let's pray. 
Father God, you have blessed us richly in so many ways, but we think right now of how you have blessed us materially. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to give back to you as an expression of our worship and our praise and our thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello. I'll be reading scriptures today for you. Our first scripture is from Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10, through to chapter 62, verse 3. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation, and he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. Our second reading comes from Galatians chapter 3, verse 23 to 25, and then over to chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian, for in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child, and if a child, then also an heir through God. Our third reading is Psalm 63. A Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O oh God, you are my God, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. My soul is satisfied as with a rich feast, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips when I think of you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadows of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be prey for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of the liars will be stopped. This is the world of the Lord. This is the last Sunday of 2020. I'm sure a lot of people are glad to say goodbye to it. I'm not going to go into a, an account of what's been going on for the last 10 months. 
Everybody with a pen or a keyboard is doing that. But a lot of us have asked, this doesn't make sense to me. What is going on? The confusion and bewilderment must be something that David was feeling when he composed Psalm 63. David, the king, was running for his life from a rebellion led by his son, Absalom. And off he runs with those who are loyal to him into the wilderness of Judea. What have I done? I have failed miserably. A son whom I dearly love has usurped my throne, the throne given to me by God himself. What have I done to get myself into this horrible mess? This does not make sense. What is going on? These thoughts must have been going through David's head. And his confusion and desperation led me to consider this psalm for the last Sunday of a bewildering and, for many, disheartening year. You've probably said so more than once as we enter 2021. This doesn't make sense. What is going on? Perhaps the only truly useful prediction for 2021 is George Carlin's weather report. Weather forecast for tonight? Dark. Continued dark overnight with widely scattered light by morning. More usefully, Glenn Pemberton puts it this way in his meditation on the Psalms. We live in a world that is beyond our control and life is in a constant flux of change. So we have a decision to make. Keep trying to control a storm that is not going to go away or start learning how to live within the rain. David, however, knew how to live within the rain. And even more, he knew how to not just live, but rejoice within the rain. Theodore Kyler wrote this quite a few years ago. Trust God in the dark. We are safer with him in the dark than without him in the sunshine. Let's pray. Father, many people are bewildered and struggling with all kinds of problems, some of them desperate. I pray that you would guide us through this psalm to be encouraged, not just encouraged, but joyful even in the rain. Amen. Despite or because of the circumstances surrounding David, Psalm 63 is a prayer of intimacy. David knew how to rejoice in his God with his whole being, even when in miserable circumstances beyond his understanding and control. To go to the other end of the spectrum, let me read something from Charles Spurgeon. Some of us know at times what it is to be almost too happy to live. The love of God has been so overpoweringly experienced by us on some occasions that we have almost had to ask for a stay of the delight because we could not endure anymore. If the glory had not been veiled a little, we should have died of excess of rapture or happiness. And I ask myself, is he talking about the same Christianity that I'm trying to hang on to? <laughs> that, that's a remarkable thing to say. I want that. You should want it too. We should all want that kind of experience 
with God. This is a beautifully composed psalm. David makes a statement about the circumstances that he's in the wilderness of Judah and he makes reference to himself later as the king which causes most commentators to say this is probably David running from Absalom's rebellion into the wilderness of Judea. So he makes that associating introduction and then he makes this declarative statement to introduce the psalm. Oh God, you are my God. I seek you. The key to many psalms is to find the central verse of the psalm. Many psalms are built like a pyramid, you know, with the point in the middle, or a wagon wheel, perhaps. But in the middle of this psalm, we find verse 6. I found myself in deep trouble and could not sleep and meditated on God. The Bible has quite a few things to say about sleep. But I want to point out that sleep can be a wonderful gift. In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. From Psalm 4. But David, in the middle of the night, in confusion, probably desperation, wondering what's going on, turns his thoughts to God. Not easy. We're going to look at this psalm and three things that I think grow out of it. David thirsts and he hungers. He faints and he feasts and then he clings. Very emotional sense type words. And dare I say this, this is a Presbyterian church and I'm a Presbyterian, but I'm going to talk about feeling worshipful toward God. And these are strong feeling terms. So we're going to look at what I will call craving. What does my soul crave for? And satisfying. What satisfies my soul? And importantly, how do I acquire what I want to satisfy my soul? How do I acquire the kind of intimacy that David had with God? The first point of David's meditation is his need for God. Thirsting for God. My soul thirsts. My flesh faints as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Hunger for God himself. Not just God's blessings, but God himself. Hunger for transcendence and worship just flow out of this psalm. He craves not for things from God, but for God himself. And he says it, and this isn't the only place. I'll just pick out one portion of a psalm, 42. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? David determines to praise God. It's a decision. It's a conscious decision and he pursues it. And I have to ask myself when I lie awake at night, as David obviously is here, what does my soul lack? Now, if, if you, and you should, ask this question to yourself. Don't answer this question flippantly or too quickly. Don't answer with what you think the right answer should be. 
or a cliche or how you want to project yourself to other people. Be honest. What does your soul lack? What does it really need? David satisfies his soul. His soul feasts on worship, on meditation. Actually, he feasts on discipline of mind and soul. Alexander Campbell used the illustration of putting a seal in wax didn't always have lickum or self-stick envelopes or stamps. They used to seal a letter with a wax seal. And to do that, you had to melt wax, pour it onto the paper when it was folded, and then take your personal seal and stamp into the wax. That was what Alexander Campbell used as an illustration of how David meditates. The wax is the heart. The heat is the spirit. And the seal is the word. For the word to take effect and make a stamp in the wax, the wax has to be softened because in its natural state, the wax is hard, it's brittle. If you try to press the seal into the wax, it'll break. It has to be heated and then it'll take the seal. I think that's where J.I. Packer got his idea of a faith view of God which he described this way. A faith view of God means to be melted by spiritual understanding of the truths we read in the scripture. That's not something that comes in a quick reading. That takes time. It takes discipline. It takes learning. It's interesting that the word meditate the Hebrew word here is also used elsewhere in the Old Testament as mumbling. And it's even used to describe a lion or a li young lion growling over its prey in Isaiah 31 verse 4. Eugene Peterson tells the story of a dog that he had that would run off into the woods and come back with a bone from a carcass that the dog had found and it would bring the bone back and it would parade back and forth. Look what I found. And then go off to his favorite solitary little spot and gnaw on the bone. Your dog has probably done the same thing and dogs will, maybe not all of them, but dogs will growl quietly in pleasure on gnawing on that bone. And that's what David uses to describe how he meditates. He wants the word to melt him so that God puts his seal on his soul. When you are experiencing communion with God, and you know what it is to be intimate with God. You say, this is worth anything. I, I, I just don't want to stop. This is worth more than my life. All your petitions turn to praise. Now think about it. If you're not in communion with God. It's kind of worthless to you. When you're not in communion with God, your life is more important than what God wants. When you're not in communion with God, 
none of your prayers seem to come out as praise. A desire to praise, a decision to praise. Praise for its own end is an important mark of intimacy, of communion with God. Jonathan Edwards writes, an important mark of true communion with God is that God is appreciated for himself, not for the benefits we derive. And another way to satisfy is to think on the things that God has done in the past for you. How has God overcome difficulties? Remember past blessings. And I want to point this out. The whole history of the Bible is the Christian's history. That's our family history book. And we have all those blessings that we can count as ours. What do we find ourselves longing for when we lie awake in the middle of the night? What races through our minds? It's hard. It takes practice and failing to learn to, I'm going to praise God. I'm going to turn this around and whatever it is I'm worried about, that's not going to control my life. You might be looking at an idol there and a decision to praise God and meditate on him and his word. What you've learned in his word, what you've memorized from his word is important. Jen Wilkin points out that if we want to feel deeply about God, we must learn to think deeply about God. And Thomas Brooks, that powerful old Puritan, says this, remember, it is not hasty reading but serious meditating upon holy and heavenly truths that makes them prove sweet and profitable to the soul. Where does my soul go to find satisfaction? Every soul feasts on something other than God. That something might be an idol. Dedicate yourself. Learn to focus on the right things. Steve Parks tells us that as human beings, we've been made by God, for God. We are creatures made for worship. The question is, who or what are we worshiping? You may be discovering that in the middle of the night. You may be discovering that in the things that preoccupy your worried mind, your confusion. Modern idols have names which sound normal. Approval, pleasure, comfort, power, control but they act the same. We draw our identity from them, we arrange our lives around them, and at our time of greatest need, they abandon us. I think Stephen Dilla was right on with that. Okay, so to satisfy my soul, I learn to dedicate myself, I learn to meditate, and take time with his word and let it sink in. And let my prayers be prayers of praise. And earnestly seek God. David talks about how my soul thirsts, my soul feasts, my soul clings. He is assured 
that God is his defender. God is his truth. God is his justice. That he will worship God and rest in God. How do we find such a relationship with God? How are we cultivating a right thirst and a right feasting? What are the means by which we can grasp mind, body, and soul, intimate fellowship with God? Well, first, there's a degree of expectation, at least, that has to come. You have to seek him. You have to spend the time. God actually wants you to seek him. That's the beginning of the melt. And if you think that you're banging your head on a brick wall, you're wrong. How do I know that? God wants you to seek him. He wants you to find him. How do I know that? Because he sent his son. He sent him to the cross, not just the manger. When you lie awake, Archbishop William Temple put it this way, your religion is what you do with your solitude. There are no easy steps. Discipline of the mind and the heart. Obedience. I will rejoice in God. As long as we drink from fountains that do not come from God, we will never be satisfied. My soul finds assurance and courage in truth. After all, Satan's been a liar and a murderer from the beginning, John tells us in his gospel in chapter 8, verse 44. And his first trick was to deceive Eve into thinking God is a miser. He isn't. God's character is faithfulness and justice and protection. God knows, David knows God as his defender. Living in the same blessed faith that Jesus articulated on the mount, David confirmed that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied, while the enemies of God's people will be destroyed. Now a word here, because at the end of the psalm, we have David talking about those who oppose him, those who are liars, who are rebelling against him, being put to the sword and being food for jackals. Jackals picked up the, they didn't have to get involved in the battle. They had a feast afterward. If your Bible says foxes, Actually, it's the same Hebrew word for both fox and jackal, so you can have it either way. But after a battle, they were well fed. That's kind of harsh to a lot of people. God's people will rejoice, not merely because their persecutors are conquered. They will rejoice in the Lord because his truth is vindicated as he fulfills his redemptive purposes. Our hearts will still fall into that same satanic groove, quickly moving from confessing, I believe in God, to talking about the God I believe in, and going right down to the most dire and pretentious utterance, I could never believe in a God who would make his enemies run along the edge of a sword, as one Hebrew translation puts it. Of course, the sad joke is that this God that people create that has no place for punishment or justice, you know, this God usually ends up being no more than our own shadows blown up to God-sized proportions. J.C. Ryle warns us, beware of manufacturing a God of your own, a God who is all mercy but not just, a God who is all love but not holy, 
a God who has a heaven for everybody, but a hell for no one. Such a God is an idol of your own. He is not the God of the Bible. God is just, and David rejoices in that. And so may we. On the last day of the feast, from John 7, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The answer to thirst. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life in John 6. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. We have a God who wants to be part of our life. Mark Galley once asked a question. He made a statement as a question to Eugene Peterson. And Mark asked, he said, Many people assume that spirituality is about becoming emotionally intimate with God. And Peterson's answer is this. That's a naive view of spirituality. What we're talking about is the Christian life. It's following Jesus. Spirituality is no different from what we've been doing for 2,000 years. Just by going to church and receiving the sacraments, being baptized, learning to pray, and reading scriptures rightly, it's just ordinary stuff. This promise of intimacy is both right and wrong. There is an intimacy with God, but it's like any other intimacy. It's part of the fabric of your life. In marriage, you don't feel intimate most of the time, nor with a friend. Intimacy isn't primarily a mystical emotion. It's a way of life, a life of openness, honesty, a certain transparency. God made mankind in his image so that we could know intimate friendship with him. And Jesus came as a man and called us friends. From John 15, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you as, so that you will love one another. Jesus is the one I most want as a friend. I don't want ever to be totally alone without Jesus. I thank God for friends who have shown me Jesus' kind of love. They have been an appetizer for the feast of Jesus' friendship. Jesus invites us to abide in his love. That means to dwell with all that I am in him. It is an invitation to a total belonging, to full intimacy, to an unlimited being with. The light of the Spirit reveals to us that love conquers all fear. And these words from Frederick Buchner. It is not the objective proof of God's existence that we want, but the experience of God's presence. That is the miracle we are really after, 
And that is also, I think, the miracle that we really get. Merry Christmas. Emmanuel. And we walk into 2021 with God as our friend. Let's worship in song.
Thank you, Jason and David. May the God who gave us this year and the Savior who walked at our side every day and the Spirit who filled us with life abundant grace the coming year with peace and hope and joy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.